This is Research Like a Pro, episode 207, Pennsylvania Germans, part one with Heidi, history. Welcome to Research Like a Pro, a genealogy podcast about taking your research to the next level, hosted by Nicole Dyer and Diana Elder, accredited genealogist professional. Diana and Nicole are the mother-daughter team at familylocket.com and the authors of Research Like a Pro, a genealogist guide. With Robin Worthland, they also co-authored the companion volume, Research Like a Pro with DNA. Join Diana and Nicole as they discuss how to stay organized, make progress in their research, and solve difficult cases. Let's go. Hi, everybody. Welcome to Research Like a Pro. Hi, Nicole. How are you today? Fantastic. I'm excited to talk about our topic today with Heidi. I am too. It's going to be so fun to talk about Pennsylvania German research and we'll have Heidi and Alice joining us for the next few episodes. Right. So what have you been working on lately? Well, I've been working on my ICAP Gen Renewal. Can you believe it's been five years since I became an accredited genealogist? I cannot believe that. (laughs) <laughs> yeah, so I've been working on getting everything together. I have to submit a project of no more than eight pages, so I had to whittle one down that was originally 20 pages, so a research report from a Texas project, and then I had to do a summary of my educational and professional development activities, and then specifically talking about two activities that were just for my Gulf South region. And then also my volunteer hours. And you need to have five hours per year, so 25 hours total volunteering for ICAP Gen, which for me, I have done many, many more than that with the various presentations and YouTube videos for our channel and my work on the commission. So plenty of volunteer hours that I have done through the years for ICAP Gen, which has been a great experience. Oh, that is fun. Well, congratulations on being accredited for five years and working on that renewal. Well, thank you. Well, it's June and next month we're going to be starting our registration for our fall Research Like a Pro study group. That registration will open on July 20th at 10 a.m. and it will go all the way through until August 25th. Then we will begin that study group on Wednesday, September 7th, meeting weekly for nine weeks with a break in October for extra research time. So if you've been thinking about joining us, we'd love to have you. And if you'd like to be a peer group leader, we have that link on our website. So if you're a peer group leader, you will receive free registration for the study group. Well, let's get right to our topic for the day, which is talking about Pennsylvania Germans and the history behind their immigration. And we have Heidi Mathis here with us again. Hi, Heidi. Hey, guys. Good to be back. So we are worked with Heidi earlier to record several podcasts and she wrote some blog posts for us all about tracing your 19th century German ancestors. That was where we talked with Heidi about the largest wave of German immigrants to the U.S. in the 19th century. So this series is going to be about the smaller group who came in the colonial period and we know them as colonial Germans or you may have heard the term Pennsylvania Dutch which is actually a misnomer of Deutsch or German and they're one of the founding groups of European settlement in North America. Although only less than 100,000 arrived in the colonial period, now millions of Americans have a Pennsylvania German in their family tree. So this will be a series of episodes where we'll talk with Heidi and then also Alice Childs, who just recently was accredited in the Mid-Atlantic region, which includes Pennsylvania. And so together with Heidi and Alice, we are going to answer all sorts of important questions about Pennsylvania German research, such as who were the Pennsylvania Germans? Why did they immigrate? Where do they fit in with the rest of colonial America? And what we all want to know is what are the key records and how do we find them? And then we're going to wrap it all up with talking about DNA and if that can be used to research Pennsylvania German ancestors. That will be a great series. And Heidi, thank you so much for writing these great blog posts and working with Alice on this. Oh, it's been so much fun. All right, Heidi, let's get started with talking about some of the most important factors to help understand and find records of Pennsylvania Germans. 
Yeah, the, the two things I want to start off with that I hope everyone can keep in mind is that what they cared about was owning land and their strong community networks. They were the largest non-English speaking colonial group. And so the Pennsylvania German community networks lasted much longer because of this language barrier. So understanding your Pennsylvania German, that they probably had a strong drive to own land and to stay part of their cohesive community is key to understanding them and finding their records. You want to be able to identify and all of your ancestors' fan club. And in this group, you're especially focusing on their land records and the idea that they were part of this community. The, the fan club here, meaning their family, their associates, their neighborhoods of your ancestor, who, who often in the beginning for Pennsylvania Germans were people who came from the same German village. Wonderful. Those are really important things to think about when getting started. It makes sense that they would be searching for land and then that will inform our research plans. You know, we should look for deeds and grants and any land records that that might have their information in there. And just to begin thinking about them and as a part of this network of other families, that's really key to being able to find yours. If if your direct ancestor doesn't have, you can't find them in the records, sometimes you can find their, their fan club in the records. All right, well, let's do a little bit of definition. Who exactly are the Pennsylvania Germans that we're going to be talking about in this series? Yeah, it's a a varied group, so it kind of casts a wide net. So since the modern state of Germany only began to exist in 1871, Pennsylvania German generally means those German-speaking immigrants who first came to North America in small numbers in the late 17th century, and then in somewhat larger numbers in the mid-18th century. These colonial-era Germans came primarily from southwest part of German land, such as the Palatinate or Faults in German, Baden-Württemberg, Hesse, Switzerland, Alsace, and all, also small numbers from the Netherlands. The reason most commonly given for the seemingly strange choice of these mostly peasant German farmers to immigrate all the way across the Atlantic to an English-speaking colony was that they were fleeing religious persecution in the aftermath of the terrible Thirty Years' War, fought earlier in the 17th century. While these were some of the reasons, there was more to the story. Interesting. I think there always is more to the story. You know, sometimes we have kind of a high-level understanding, and then when we dig deeper, we find that there is more. So why did so many Germans leave everything behind they knew to risk going to a faraway English colony in the 17th and 18th centuries? Yeah, I was so fascinated by this question, and you know, I'm still working on the answer, but um, I found some some good information for this blog post. So, the short answer was for most of these Pennsylvania Germans, it was the large land grants on offer in Pennsylvania. William Penn first received a charter from the English King Charles II in 1681 for the colony of Pennsylvania. Penn hoped to create a haven in the New World for English Quakers who had been so persecuted in England. But for his colony to succeed financially, Penn needed more settlers. So if the Germans' need for land and Penn's need for more paying settlers for his land in the new colony pulled them, what pushed the Germans from their homeland? It often depends on which era they came in. So Pennsylvania German immigration can be thought of as having three general phases. The earliest group of Germans arrived in North America starting around 1683. These very early Germans were mostly fleeing uh, religious persecution due to the aftermath of the Thirty Years' War, which was fought between 1618 and 1648. So in the decades just before these early German-speaking immigrants came to North America. But by about 1707 to 1714, a second group began to immigrate because of crop, a crop failure crisis. This second group sometimes is referred to as the Poor Palatine Germans, a name they got when they were refugees in England before they settled in New York. The last group 
was from about 1717 to about 1775, and this was the largest group. And the one focused most on in this blog post that I wrote, and their reasons for immigrating can be boiled down to a drive to own land. Yeah, I'm really thinking about this 30 years war. And I just remember from history classes, that was a really destructive European war. And thinking about the fact that after that, there was a lot of religious persecution for Germans. I didn't realize that. Yeah, it's absolutely so interesting. Our our history that we get in the United States is obviously really focused on North America and in England. And we often see European history mostly through English eyes. And so I think one of the fun things for me about doing genealogy is just the chance to see European history a little bit more through another country, Germany in this case. It's one of the most wonderful things about doing genealogy research, I think. It's that understanding history from the perspective of our people from no matter where they came from and doing research for other people and helping others. It's just fascinating to learn from the eyes of their ancestors too, what, what life was like. Tell us more about why they were migrating because of the problem of religious freedom. Well, I'll start by saying that one of my main sources for this blog post was this great book I read called German Immigration, Settlement, and Political Culture in Colonial America, 1717 to 1775. The author, Aaron Spencer Fogelman, traces many of the factors behind the Pennsylvania German immigration and their cultural behavior in North America. Like we were talking about the Thirty Years' War, understanding German history here is important for this first wave of colonial German-speaking immigrants to North America. So yeah, one of the most pivotal events in German history was the Thirty Years' War that was kind of earlier in the 17th century. And until the 20th century world wars, it was the most devastating and scarring war in German lands. The Thirty Years' War started out as a big, as a religious war that kind of came in the aftermath of the Protestant Reformation that had happened in the 16th century. Fogelman said that about 40% of the population of Southwest Germany was lost by death or dislocation in this war. So in the decades after this devastating war, the population of Southwest German lands spiked. And this population spike happened to occur just prior to when the Pennsylvania became a colony. Though like most German immigrants, Pennsylvania Germans were mostly Lutheran or Catholic, Far more of these earliest 17th century immigrants belonged to smaller sects. And this was because the Thirty Years' War, those belonging to smaller sects almost all immigrated, or that those that stayed behind in German lands kind of had to convert either to Catholicism or Protestantism. So kind mm-hmm. of successive waves of immigration were, were almost always Catholic or Protestant. Fogelman argued that even though religious freedom was an important factor in this first wave, um, especially for these smaller sects, such as the Mennonites, the Amish, or the Moravians, that even in this earlier group that generally religious persecution has been somewhat exaggerated as a push factor for Pennsylvania Germans. Yeah, it's hard to know. I guess it could be very individualized depending on the group and the people. And, you know, maybe they just, one family decided to go from a Mennonite sect and then their friends who happened to also be Mennonites went with them. Like, it's hard to really isolate those reasons. But it certainly is interesting to think about the fact that those smaller religious sects did come over more, you know, or converted. Yeah, just understanding all of that is so, so interesting. And it's always important for everyone to realize that these are just general points and that your individual person may have had a a quite unique journey. (laughs) Well, I think that's a great point because this is a long time ago and we have history, but how our ancestor fits into that history is sometimes just pure speculation, right? (laughs) That's why we use qualifiers and sales probably or possibly, you know, this is what happened. But unless there's a record, we really Definitely. don't necessarily know. So, but it is great to put them in the context of what is happening in history. Well, let's get to another question. Why did Pennsylvania German immigration peak in the mid 18th century? Yeah, this was so interesting to me. 
So we're talking about that third wave that was the largest. And I'm sure men, many family researchers have thought to themselves, what would lead so many German speaking people to make such a difficult journey across the Atlantic Ocean to this largely unknown English colony um, when they would have just, you know, they had the choice to just um, immigrate within Europe? So interestingly, Fogelman's book, Hopeful Journeys, estimated that only about 15% of the Germans who were on the move in this period actually did immigrate to North America, and that the other 85% just immigrated to other parts of Europe. So why were they on the move? The answer for this third wave of Pennsylvania Germans was land. The rumors of great stretches of land may have enticed those who would have become Pennsylvania Germans to risk the uncertainties of North America, as opposed to simply immigrating within Europe. So the desire for land is at the heart of understanding Pennsylvania Germans. What was happening in Southwest German lands in this third wave from about 1717 to 1775? Fogelman explained the deeper history in Southwest Germany that would later contribute to so many immigrating in the 18th century. In short, he argued that Southwest German land since the 11th century, there was a cycle of farming innovation that led to population explosion, which then led to out-migration and then population decline, followed by immigration, kind of in a cycle. In other words, Southwest German lands had a long history of people on the move. In fact, German lords long knew this area as a place that often had a surplus population that they could recruit for settlement er elsewhere in German lands or for raising armies. Another factor was that partible inheritance was generally practiced in the southwest part of German lands. Partible inheritance was where a family's land was divided among all sons as opposed to only the oldest or the youngest son inheriting everything which was practiced in other parts of Germany. Therefore, as the population increased in the 18th century, smaller and smaller parcels of land were inherited, squeezing these peasant farmers. In addition to these factors, as I said earlier, Fogelman pointed out that there was a pattern of in and out migration in Southwest Germany and that out migration was abetted by the authorities. So in the mid 18th century, there was an especially large population boom. Vogelman stated that the population of Europe increased dramatically in the 18th century by about 70% between 1720 and 1800. Wow. This population pressure increased tensions between peasant farmers and their lords. The farmers of southwest German lands were generally not as passive as one might imagine of peasant farmers. Peasants often collectively fought back against their lords to stop the lords from squeezing too much out of them. For those who came to America, this collective behavior was no doubt fostered further by the language barrier in Pennsylvania. Land and this collective behavior explains much of what motivated our Pennsylvania German ancestors, and so understanding this will help us find their records. For example, Fogelman shows this cohesiveness by explaining that half of Pennsylvania Germans were too poor to pay their ship's passage, and so had to put themselves on the market as indentured servants. Who bought the rights of these German indentured servants? Most often, it was other Germans with whom they had a connection, either familial or from being from the same village. So paying off one's debt was key to staying in the good graces of the community they depended on for survival. So very few German indentured servants appear to have reneged on their obligation. This strategy of cooperation had helped them survive in German lands, and it helped them overcome their poverty and language barrier in a faraway English colony. Those close family and community ties make researching fan clubs of your Pennsylvania German much more helpful as a research tool than perhaps for other groups. Okay, there is a lot to unpack there. <laughs> I am super interested in this book, Hopeful Journeys. It sounds so fascinating. But what I kept thinking of when you were talking about how this migrating within Europe was our DNA. And we have this thing with our ethnicity that the DNA companies can't quite pinpoint exactly how much German, how much English, how much French. And it makes so much sense because if they were migrating within 
for hundreds of years, it would be very difficult to figure that out. It's so interesting to think about that. Yeah, that there was just a lot of in and out migration in different parts of Europe that was happening all the time. And it does explain a lot. Right. Well, the other thing that I thought was so interesting, and I know we'll talk about this later in some of our episodes with Alice, is this whole idea of indentured servitude and how interesting that they often were within a community you know, buying the rights of these indentured servants and that they were really cooperating as a group, which just kind of explains more about the importance of the fan club in the research. So, so many insights that Fogelman gives us. Yeah, I'm just thinking, you know, if I am tracing a German trying to get them back to their hometown, if there's some records about the indentured servitude and I happen to find, you know, the person who sponsored them, that would be a really good person to trace back in time to Germany you know. Absolutely. And um, some other experts I've listened to have really emphasized this point. And I know Alice will talk about it in later episodes, but like the ship's list, I think I've understood that seeing who is next to them on the ship's list for Pennsylvania Germans is just kind of even more important than for other groups, that that's more likely that they're all from the same village. Wow. Good tip. Let's go to politics. So what role did Pennsylvania politics play in all of this emigration? Yeah, we discussed in another podcast on the book American Nations. Um, Pennsylvania Germans were part of what the author Colin Woodard called uh, the Midland Nation. And in the beginning, Pennsylvania politics were defined by a struggle within this so-called Midland Nation. So in this early colonial period, there was a big clash between the Quakers, the Germans, and the Scots-Irish in Pennsylvania. In fact, frustrated by German political clout, none other than Benjamin Franklin fell prey to kind of our American tendency to otherize immigrant groups. See if you can hear our American pattern of fearing immigrants and what he said about the Pennsylvania Germans. Quote, Those who come hither are generally of a most ignorant and stupid sort of their own nation, and as few of the English understand the German language, and so cannot address them either from the press or pulpit, it is almost impossible to remove any prejudice they once entertained. Not being used to liberty, they know not how to make modest use of it. I remember when they modestly declined intermeddling in our elections, but now they come in droves and carry all before them, except for in one or two counties. In short, unless the stream of their importation could be turned from this to other colonies, as you very judiciously propose, they will soon so outnumber us that all the advantages we have will not, in my opinion, be able to preserve our language and even our government will become precarious." Why should Pennsylvania, founded by the English, become a colony of aliens who will shortly be so numerous as to Germanize us instead of our anglifying them, and will never adopt our language or customs any more than they can acquire our complexion, unquote. Oh, wow. So I just thought that was a funny funny quote about how scary the Pennsylvania Germans were, and he even, in another quote, said that they were swarthy, and, you know, it's just kind of interesting how that kind of repeats itself in our in our history. Oh my goodness. Swarthy means dark skinned, right? I just had to look it up. Right. <laughs> totally. <laughs> I didn't realize that to the Englishmen that Germans had like a darker complexion. I didn't even know that was a thing. I don't think they did. I just think that he saw them that way and it just shows how we easily see others as different from us when, you know, honestly we're all the same underneath. <laughs> So anyway, I just thought that was kind of so fun. (laughs) So just to carry on about this kind of political clash that was going on in Pennsylvania. So the Germans and Quakers and Scots-Irish were clashing over who would control Pennsylvania government. But in the end, the Germans and Quakers found they had much more in common and formed this moderate Midland nation as described in the book, American Nations, that we talked about earlier. And the Scots-Irish went on to form what Woodard called the Nation of Appalachia. So despite fears like Franklin's, what the Quakers and Pennsylvania Germans ultimately had in common was their desire to be free from the other nations, especially the zealous Yankeedom nation or the hierarchical Tidewater nation. 
um, nations that reminded both the Quakers and the Pennsylvania Germans too much of the lords that they had left behind in Europe and, and made them see that they had more in common than they realized. So the Pennsylvania Germans desire for land and autonomy, plus their being the only major colonial immigrant group to speak a language other than English meant that they formed a somewhat insular community. And they tended to stay together in the decades after the colonial period, even when some went on to migrate to Ontario, Canada, or to Ohio or Indiana, and then on through the upper Midwest. Pennsylvania Germans mostly stayed within their communities to a striking degree and only truly gave up the widespread use of German after World War II. They really clung on to that language. That's cool. Yeah. Well, this reminds me of my Eisenhower project and how I discovered that the Eisenhowers stayed within a German community from Pennsylvania to North Carolina and then even out to Missouri. But after the Civil War, so about, you know, 1850, 1860, that mid-1800s, the next generation went to Arkansas, Louisiana, into Texas, and then they lost that German community, and I'm assuming the language, they anglicized the name instead of E-I, it became I-S, and so, you know, I totally saw that. That's so amazing to think about and that those community ties were still so important generations later. Yeah, so it seems like for about 100 years, they kept with their German communities. All right, so to wrap this up, let's just talk a little bit about Pennsylvania. And was this the only place where German immigrants landed in the 1700s? Well, while most colonial Germans did settle in Pennsylvania after they landed in the port of Philadelphia and they would settle in the immediate county surrounding Philadelphia, not all ended up in Pennsylvania. As I mentioned earlier, the the Palatine Germans settled in New York. And so besides Pennsylvania and New York, they also settled in Virginia, Maryland, and in the Carolinas. So maybe that's where the Eisenhowers ended up going. Some of them came through the port of Charleston, I believe, and then up into the Carolinas. So, But wherever your Pennsylvania German ancestors first settled, kind of to sum up, acquiring land and staying close to their community was most likely top of mind. So understanding the land, the probate, the church, ships list, and tax records of colonial America will be key to walking in their footsteps. And our colleague, Alice Childs, will be helping us to find these records in the next podcast. And then for the last podcast, I'll come back and discuss using DNA for helping us to find our Pennsylvania Germans. Oh, thank you so much. Well, I had to go check my family tree really quick and see if my Eisenhowers really were in Pennsylvania, or maybe they just started in in the Carolinas, but they were in Pennsylvania. And so they did the migration down to North Carolina, then... I actually tracked my John D. Eisenhower to Tennessee and then into Missouri. And it looks like in Tennessee that he was with a community of Germans as well. And I need to research that. That's going to be another project, which sounds super fun. Well, this has been just so fascinating, Heidi, to talk all about this. And I love that you referred back to the American nations. So, you know, that was a really fun discussion, that podcast and that blog post. Just fascinating. Absolutely. And like you were saying, I've noticed that like collateral lines of my Pennsylvania Germans also went into the South. So it, I don't think it was un- uncommon at all for some of them to go South. They, they didn't all stay in the Midland, you know, sort of in that upper Midwest area of North America. I really learned a lot from you, Heidi, about the Penn colony needing to get some more people to make it financially solvent. And that's probably why the Germans came there because he was advertising his colony as a place for people to settle and get land and they wanted land. Mm. Those are really important things to know. And thank you so much for sharing that with us. Oh, it was so much fun. I learned so much. All right, everybody. We look forward to continuing this series about Pennsylvania Germans and discussing the records with Alice. So we will talk to you all again next week. Bye. All right. Bye-bye, everyone. See you next time. Thank you for listening. We hope that something you heard today will help you make progress in your research. 
If you want to learn more, purchase our books, Research Like a Pro and Research Like a Pro with DNA on Amazon.com and other booksellers. You can also register for our online courses or study groups of the same names. Learn more at familylocket.com slash services. To share your progress and ask questions, join our private Facebook group by sending us your book receipt or joining our courses. To get updates in your email inbox each Monday, subscribe to our newsletter at familylocket.com slash newsletter. Please subscribe, rate, and review our podcast. We read each review and are so thankful for them. We hope you'll start now to research like a pro.